All right. For the first time here in 2024, Talking Buffalo is live at Imperial Pizza here in South Buffalo. I am joined. If you're watching this on the video side, okay, most people listen audio side, but there will be some people who are certainly watching us on the video side. You can see right next to me. I am joined by my good buddy, CBS Sports, Chris Trapasso. Well, I guess I'll start by asking you, how you doing? Then we're going to have a funny story. Yeah, we have another. Maybe not that funny. We but. have another funny story to tell. A very uh, huge coincidence. Everything's going good. I mean, outside of the start of football season, this is my favorite time of the year. Sure. We're less than a month. or We're exactly four weeks away from the draft, however you want to call it, a month. Uh, so cramming, watching a lot of film, well over 200 prospects that I've watched, a lot of Bills stuff, doing some One Bills Live here and there. So it's it's good time. And for me – 40, 50 degrees, I'm fine with it. We kind of have a different take on the weather. But Very now the weather's different. starting to turn. Uh, so, yeah, everything's going well with me. And thanks for having me again. Well, I'm very glad to have you. But before we get into Bill's talk here, and before we get into even the wings that we had tonight, because they were really, really good. Yeah, and we're going to get to those in a second here at Imperial Pizza. I gotta Let's have a little bit of a story time right now. Yeah, because this is it, well, it's not funny, but it is funny, I guess, in oh. hindsight. Because there's been – nobody's been harmed – during these stunts here. So I've done probably, I don't know, I want to say maybe 60, 70 of these shows live between Imperial Pizza and a bunch of other bars, okay? I've had Chris on with me twice now, yeah. live. Mm -hmm. And of three times out of about 70, I've had something go wrong with the podcast. You're twice now. I've been the victim twice. You've been the victim literally twice. So here's what happened this time. All right, well, actually, let's start with the first time. The last time I had you on the podcast. 2021. 2021, October 2021. We met up at Macy's Place Pizzeria by the airport in Chicawaga. Yep. Yes. Um, this was before they expanded to the Kenmore location. Very, uh, that was a, a trendy, still is, a, a no, trendy sure. place to go and eat and get some wings. So you and I met there, banged out some wings, really good. Uh, we started to tape a show right after. Now, this was a little bit different because this was before I started doing video. Mm -hmm. So this was only audio. But you and I sat there, tiny little place in Macy's Place oh, Pizzeria, yeah, crammed like kind of in a bar stool area against the windows. That was the only place to eat or, or to sit. So we started recording. And maybe what? I ask you one, two questions. I think and two, yeah. Five minutes into the show, I have a soda. And I spill it. All over the tape Expensive recorder. Expensive equipment. Yeah. Right. Right. Wasn't it? Yeah. It was. It was. It was. An, it was a, a mobile recorder. I spilled shit all over it, so it fried, and we had to stop after five minutes. And this was in Chicawaga, and we ended up going back to my little home studio, which room is great. And it's in gotten West better Seneca. since then. It right. has. It has. So we ended up doing the show, mm -hmm. but you know, we went from Macy's Place Pizzeria and had to go all the way back to my house in West Seneca. All right, here tonight live at Imperial Pizza, um, I get all set up. Everything's good to go. Um, I go to the restaurant area, waiting for my man Chris to show up. He shows up. We sit down. Uh, we have wings. We go to the table. We got a 7.15 p.m. stream time start, and the computer's not turning on. I'm like, what the hell's going on? The computer's <laughs> dead. I can't turn it on. We try to use, you have a laptop here as well tried to use it but we couldn't connect the camera and as it turns out like i bought a bunch of backup gear like a duplicate of pretty much every single thing that i have in my home studio so you don't have to remove the studio right equipment. because yep. it's a real pain in me as much as i love doing these live shows the part about it that i've always hated is having to pack everything take, up. yeah pack everything up bring it here unpack it set up do the same thing back home so i've slowly over time bought a duplicate set of everything well anyway the Laptop charger that I bought, the duplicate either is default or what, or, or fault, work. I should say, or didn't work. Because long story short, we literally couldn't get my laptop this on. This computer was not turning on. It was, <laughs> it was dead. So I had to go all the way back to, to West Center, go to my house, drive back here to South Buffalo, which, by the way, probably committed a couple felonies <laughs> driving. I'm telling broke you, man. the speed limit a little. I broke the speed limit a lot. Didn't run any red lights, but I, you know how it gets when you're in a real hurry and yep. people are driving slow, they're joyriding in front of you. Oh, it was the most frustrating 11-minute ride each way. What's good about ever. this is that I'm always down to talk bills. I'm always down to talk NFL and draft. So when you said, hey, it's got to, I got to go 10 minutes, like, I can wait 20 total minutes so we can sit down and bang out this awesome show podcast that's 
bill centric draft centric nfl wide centric yeah yeah for sure so anyway we're back here now long story short on the video side we're live this will be available later on on demand too of course as well as uh the audio side quickly too i told you i had three mishaps yeah who's the in the one? history of the talking buffalo the other one was here also at imperial pizza i had uh rachel hotmeyer and yep, joe yurden okay and joe yurden with me and what happened with that show is we started taping and this one was live on video too mm. Literally three minutes in, a little kid who was at a booth yanked out the extension cord. That was oh. plugged in. So the mixer's gone. The camera's You've gone. You've had about all that could happen. Outside of spilling right on your laptop something, right? spilling Pepsi on the equipment, having that plug out, and then this plug not work. You've kind of run the gamut. I think you're good for I it. have. I have. And Listen, man. Maybe someday we'll be old uh, sitting at a bar, having some wings and a couple beers, <laughs> talking about our – our careers here in sports media. <laughs> we'll look back and we'll laugh that every time sure. I have Chris Trapasso on the show, something goes wrong on the technical it's side. It's all good. <laughs> all good. Anyway, so yeah, we are here live at Imperial Pizza. This is the first time I've been here live, actually, this year in 2024. It's been almost three months. You're I'm out just, of your hibernation. Yeah, I am. I'm officially out of hibernation now. I'm ready to start doing shows. I don't like being cold, man. I don't like traveling to places I don't need to and packing up the shit and bringing it when, yeah, when it's cold it. out. What kind of wings did we have here tonight? We had, uh, we had three different kinds. Chevettas. Chevettas hot. They, which those had some heat. They did have some. The At Cajun, least of the three, though. The Cajun honey hot or whatever, right? Hot, hot honey Cajun. Cajun. Those were cranked hot. it up. No, those were almost, I like some heat. Those were almost more heat than I can handle, okay. which is kind of saying a lot. And then we had Jamaican jerk, which is a Joe Yer, and I mentioned him earlier, uh, a favorite. Now, Look, mediums are mediums at most places, sure. or hot or hot. I, I mean, it's not completely true. Some are obviously better than others. Yep. But I've had a million shows here. I've eaten wings here a million times. I didn't want you to have medium. Plus, you've been mediums here yeah. before. Yeah, it's yeah. not your first have, time here. No, it's not. This is a great spot. And by the this way, here is in my South dad, Buffalo. So this is my dad's favorite Buffalo-style pizza. He's a big Buffalo-style pizza enthusiast. And mm -hmm. just the expansion that they've done here with the, with the yeah. big square bar and so much seating. The wings were, I think, each th like each order, the three that we got, we're all like between a seven and an eight. They yeah. were all just rock solid. You know the pizza's good here, and it's packed. It's it's Thursday night. I, I feel like every time I've been here, it's always loaded because there's full bar, there's great pizza and great wings. Yeah, for sure. Um, You know, I'm glad you said it about the wings, too. One of my favorite things about this place, why I love eating here, why I love coming here, why I love doing the shows here, this place I've always said is like it's consistent. And it's almost like a utility knife. Like if you go to some places, you can get a killer sub somewhere. Like maybe you know somewhere that's got a great steak sub and you love it. But besides that, nah. not much. Some places got great pizza and terrible wings, or some places this got place great wings. This place, you can come here. Like if you want to eat like shit all the time <laughs> and, and live live your life eating dinners at pizzerias three, four, five nights a week. You could come here. Get something different on the menu. Yeah, you can time. get something different yeah. different each time, and, yep. and it's always good. This is a true, legitimate South Buffalo staple. I yep. always say this place, Doc Sullivan's, if you want food, you want drink, you want that vibe, you want that atmosphere, this is definitely out of the place to be. What about said, Blackthorn, too? Blackthorn and Seneca Street, too. Yeah, yeah that's good. That, that's a really good spot as well. All right, so yeah, we're going to get into some, some Bill's it. talk here in, in, in just a few minutes. So, but, um, Actually, so we're taping this live here on Thursday, and you did one Bill's Drive earlier today, right? Yes, I did. Oh, uh, was that, man? It's great. The producer, Jay Harris, that I, I've been doing it since 2021, he reached out uh, now three years ago uh, to kind of see if, if I was available to be kind of their backup person. Mm -hmm. And whether it's Steve out or if Chris Brown's on vacation or Maddie Gleb can't do it, I'm usually their like, main fill-in person. I'm super grateful for that. Uh, the show today, or I guess yesterday, if you're watching this afterward, um, I didn't have any guests, but we just got to talk draft the entire time and kind of reset where the bills are. Sounds After like that's up your alley. Too. Yeah, it, it, it was right up my alley. They've all been super nice. Steve's a great guy. Chris is awesome. And I think Maddie Gleb is awesome at her job, and she really knows football really well. So I've been super grateful, and I've loved doing that. I always jump on those opportunities when they ask. Um Take us a little bit, like kind of behind the scenes, a sure. little bit, like so. When you go to like do one bills, one bills live, like what what's your day like? Let's say on a day where you know you're going to be hosting. Yeah. Like, take us behind like your day, like your entire day leading up to, okay. like maybe your prep for the show, uh -huh. going to getting set up to do the show, stuff like that. Yeah, kinda good question. Take us behind the curtain um, a little. So bit. at least a day or two before the producer, like the main guy Jay Harris, and there's a, a great team there of like four or five other people that are in studio. 
um, that are kind of behind the scenes, mm -hmm. uh, he'll send like, hey, we're going to talk about this, this, and anything else that you want to talk about. We're going to have Jim Nagy from the Senior Bowl on, so maybe we'll ask about some Senior Bowl guys. Usually the night before and then morning of, beyond just my normal CBS Sports duties, I'll definitely do some research on, all right, who am I going to ask for the Senior Bowl, say, and – uh, it of course it depends. Is it in is it during the season where it's easy to find stuff every week? It's just a constant churn, or is it in the off season? Is it right before free agency? They give me at least a day or two to do some of that prep. I live in Medina, so it's like a solid hour drive down to Orchard Park. That is a haul. It's man. a haul. It's a haul. It, it's it's fifty five minutes to an hour. Uh, Make me feel bad that I no screwed it's good. up the it's equipment good. here. I'm used, to it. <laughs> I'm used to it, and uh, so I leave by around eleven o'clock after I do the prep, do my CBS uh, sports stuff, get there by twelve fifteen, twelve thirty, and then whoever I'm hosting with, we kind of for the twenty to thirty minutes before the show, go over a little rundown that they have a uh, 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 like computer program called like the Rundown Creator, and we kind of go, okay, first block, we'll talk here. It's not super scripted, but we definitely know what we're talking about in each segment. Take mm -hmm. callers. There's a Twitter question. It's just a really fun interactive show. And I feel, again, really grateful that I can go on there and just give my thoughts on the Bills. You know, it, I've known you for a while, for, for quite a long time Buffalo now. Sports Daily. Yeah, Buffalo Sports I, Daily. Yeah, and uh, you're a, a right right trade. Yeah. You know, and as the years have evolved, as we've gotten older and sports media has evolved and for changed. Sure. you got to do different you've, stuff. Yeah, you've had to learn, you know, whether it's audio podcasting, vidcasting, all kinds of stuff, TV, radio. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got you got, you got to be much more well-rounded now sure. than back in the day where, say, it was just about writing. So about the process a little bit of getting, like, say, you, you know, I, I asked you about One Bill's Drive, and, and knowing that you're going to be on television, you know uh -huh. there's going to be plenty of eyeballs on yeah. you and, and stuff like that. Talk about the, the process of, of getting comfortable being behind, whether it's in front of the camera, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, in, in front of a microphone, knowing that a lot of people yeah. are going to be listening, as opposed to when you're writing. Because to me, it, it's a different element. So it's, just talk about that process of getting comfortable doing that. It's totally different. Uh, fortunately, like you're mentioning, how the media world has changed over the last 10 to 15 years when I've been in it. Mm -hmm. uh, as it started out, I would get occasional radio spots. Right. And of course, like anyone, the first couple, I was nervous. And then, oh, it's not that bad. Doing so many of those were great practice runs for TV. And the first time I was ever on a CBS Sports HQ video, yeah, it was a little nerve wracking. Sure. But you know this. We're doing it now. And, and we'll certainly get into it with the Bills. I've, I've said this to my wife, to my friends. They're like, oh, how do you do it? Once you're talking about your thing and you're in the zone, yeah, you almost over time, you forget that there's a camera right there and, and oh, how many people are watching? I mean, maybe if I was on Sports Center or something and there was millions of people watching, it would be a little different. The heart rate will get going a little. But once you're talking bills and NFL and drafting things that you know and that you're passionate about. Your confidence level grows. Yeah, and, and and it grows from the radio. And But what I do, I have a kind of a problem with, I sometimes talk really fast. And it's, Me too. I've, I've been told that it's yeah. for the, like, you want to almost feel feel robotic and talk very slow so it's easy for your viewers to follow you so sometimes i have to tell myself slow down a little bit so it's easier to follow but beyond that we're just talking bills and that's how i feel on one bills live and i'm just doing those reps i'm not as nervous really at all anymore uh you know it's funny you say that too because that's a, on occasion could still be something that i struggle with i just have thoughts in my head and they just come, come out. out. Yeah, yeah. The words come out of my mouth real quick. In fact, it was Tim Graham a handful of years ago that said, Yay, slow down. Slow down a little bit. You I've know, had people really... say take a breath to me, and I'm like, Oh, that's yeah. I probably should. <laughs> You're um, I don't know. For me, like you played sports, yep. you know, athletics, it doesn't even matter what sport. They used to say, like, for, for good players, like football, basketball, whatever, that the game slows down for them, mm -hmm. like in their head. Yeah. I kind of feel like when it comes to doing TV or it does or video, it definitely does. It slows down because you know when you're not comfortable and you're getting used to the craft, so to speak, you're you're thinking a million things in your mind and you want to say everything at once and you don't want to forget. And like you said to your point, we're talking real fast and just everything seems to be like helter skelter. And I feel yeah. like as you get more experience more doing it, more reps. Like I'm sure when you're on TV now, it's like it's slowed down for you for sure. a, a little bit. You yeah. know what I'm saying? If, if that kind of, uh, if that makes sense. Yep. Anyway. All right. So let, let's turn our attention here to the Buffalo bills. I, I know this is, like I said, 
this is your thing, man. And this is a big reason why I wanted to have you on the show here, especially around this time of year. Before we get into some some draft talk, in fact, we'll we'll start with like the offseason going into free agency and a little bit into free agency. More specifically with the Buffalo Bills, obviously you follow them real close as, as well as around the league, but what's been your assessment so far of what the Buffalo Bills have done and like what has been maybe one or two things that you've seen from the Bills this offseason that you like, whether well, it could be big or small, resigning their own, adding guys, additions, subtractions, or maybe, you know, also one or two things that maybe you're, I don't want to say they're the raw move. I would just say it's a raw move sure. in March. Yeah. But at least you're skeptical about okay. something that they've done. I'll start with what's kind of a controversial take, um, but it's something that I actually like that the Bills did. I was fine with them cutting Mitch Morse. I, I, I thought – Given his age, he was set to be like a ten or eleven million dollar cap hit. The concussion history, he's getting into or he's into his thirties. And I know interior blockers can play 34, 35. I just felt like it was time that he had taken a pay cut in the past. And this is not me just retrospectively saying this or using hindsight. You can look on Valentine's Day. I wrote on Twitter just my mock offseason in terms of free agency, and it was cut Mitch Morse that I thought it was time and I knew how good this center class was you can get a center that's not going to cost you 11 million dollars and this is I I did not love the Ryan Bates trade you've kind of told me that maybe they weren't ever really planning on him to be the heir apparent at center but it kind of felt like the day where they cut Mitch Morse and Jordan Poyer and Tredavious White it was oh what are they doing it kind of felt like for as much as those players have kind of been woven into the fabric of Bills fans and this community the last five years, kind of felt like it was time. Really, Deontay Hardy is the only one that was like a newer face that they let go of, but he was really not part of the offense. I thought they probably could have used him, but then I realized that they can also get a Deontay Hardy type in the draft, lower in free agency. They signed someone better in Curtis Samuel. So that's kind of my controversial or against the grain takeaway that I was like, oh, when they when they got rid of those players, they needed to, to get the cap space, and I thought it was time. Let me, before we get into the good stuff, let, let, let's stick with that, because yeah. to me, that's really interesting. In terms of the Ryan Bates thing, uh, I want to be clear about this, too. I was listening to Eric Wood's podcast, yeah, uh, Saturday Night Buffalo. Excellent, excellent podcast. He gets uh, players on every week, or somebody from the Bills organization, maybe a 25-30 minute conversation. This week, he had on Connor McGovern and Connor said on the show, they, they, he was surprised. He didn't think Mitch Morse was going to get cut. But when he signed with the Bills, the plan, he says, was pretty much always for him to eventually take over, take over yeah. at center. So it's not like this is a big surprise to Connor McGovern, at least based on what he said. And my takeaway from that was, well, wow. Um, you know, I would have thought last year if Mitch Morse suffered a concussion or had any injury, it been Bates. that it would have been Ryan yeah. Bates. That played center, but as it turns out, I think the plan was to move him to center and either Edwards or Bates to guard. I think the surprise element, um, Chris came more because what was it, 24 hours before when they traded Ryan Bates? Yeah, when they traded him Chicago, it made it it felt you know, you said you tweeted, but you're right, you you called it before it happened. I, on the other hand, was thinking it could happen, and then when they traded Ryan Bates, I tweeted. There's no way. That ain't happening. All right, well, they're set at center for for 2024, and it's Mitch Morse. I think some people are a little taken back as well because you could point to the line and say – It was good It was good. It was the best offensive line, I think, during this Josh Allen era. And not only were they productive and effective, but they were also healthy. Yeah, too. You know, all all five guys played all 17 games Mm -hmm. together to start. But to your point, it always does come a time. And, you know, we talk about Bill Belichick being famous for – getting rid of a guy a year too soon as opposed to a, a, a year or two later or you know what yeah, I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. When it's time, yeah. basically, is what yeah. I'm telling yeah. you. Um, uh-huh. So, yeah, I mean, in hindsight, you saw it coming. I didn't, so Beyond, now I have the power of hindsight. I'm like, all right, it does make sense. Just, just again, because of his age, I, I don't think his season was bad last year. Do I think he was the player he was in 2019 when they brought him in or 2020? No, I, I thought there was a little bit of a decline. He's not a great people mover in the run game. The, the, the locker room stuff apparently is really good. I don't know that. So I wasn't judging it based on sure. that. Um, but it just kind of felt like it was time. And as far as the players that they've brought in, I think given the minimal amount of cap space that the bills had outside of Curtis Samuel, that there hasn't been a, you know, seismic signing, of course, I thought Brandon Bean has done a pretty good job adding in some of those sure. depth pieces. 
along the defensive line to go into free agency with Ed Oliver, and that's it, a defensive tackle, re-sign Daquan Jones, bring in Austin Johnson, who's another big space eater. They just signed someone today, Deshaun Williams, who's bounced around the league as kind of a rotational piece defensive lineman. Nicholas Morrow to add more athleticism to a linebacker group that was ravaged, and you had Tyler Matakavich out there covering Travis Kelsey in the divisional round and A.J. Klein. I think he's done a pretty good job, and there's some – uh, criticism for Brandon Bean's drafts over the last, you know, from like 2019 to 2021, not crazy good. In free agency, he usually does a good job finding those mid to low level, the John Browns and the Cole Beasley's um, that can be good players and don't have to be huge impact guys, but will fill in those niches. I've been impressed given the lack of cap space with the job that Brandon Bean's done. It feels like he's done, if nothing else, I think he's done a good enough job that they're going to go into the draft, which we'll get to here shortly, where there's not one. It's not a telegraph. It's, it's not one of those. I don't need Christian Brasso on the show. I could go ask this person sitting there <laughs> where, where the Bills, at least what position they're going to yeah. go in the first round. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's not as cut and dry because he's done enough. I want to circle back, though, to the Mitch Morris thing. Do yep. you think, in your opinion, do you think Aaron Cromer would have Any say? a voice in that room, a significant voice in that room? Like, say if Aaron Cromer was to pound the table – saying this is a mistake. We need Mitch Morris here for another year. He probably stays. Do you think he has that kind of clout in, in the coach's room to say, this is my center, I, I think this is a bad move? Or do you think that maybe Aaron Cromer, conversely, might have said, you know what, I can make Connor McGovern work here at center? I think more of the latter, and I will go to what they did re-signing David Edwards, because David Edwards hmm? played in Los Angeles with the Rams, with Aaron Cromer. So, of course, I'm not going to say that I that – I, can guarantee that this happened, but I think it's more of the latter of what you said, that if anything, Aaron Cromer said, look, I have my guy, David Edwards, as kind of an insurance, but potentially week one starter at left guard. Let's move Connor McGovern to center if we need to do that for, for salary cap reasons. And I, I think more than anything else, again, Mitch Morris being an $11 million cap hit was more prohibitive than anything else. And there's sure. more of a reason why he was let go. So I think if anything, Cromer was like, all right, we can make this work. Maybe Bean goes to him and says, can we maybe slide McGovern to center? And then your guy from the Rams, David Edwards, who was kind of that jumbo package, sixth mm -hmm. offense lineman, let's slide him back into guard where he had his best football uh, or was playing his best football in Los Angeles. I would say Cromer was like, yeah, let's do that. Do you – Um. so it felt like it was kind of orchestrated as a plan because it was like a three-step thing. It all happened real boom, quick. Boom, David boom. Edwards resigns. Ryan Bates traded. Mitch Morris cut. It's like they, they kind of figured this yep. is where we're going to go. Um, Two-part question here. Do you have confidence that Connor McGovern could slide over and play effective at center? Now, he's not new to the position. Again, he was recruited out of high school as a center, played, at, played, played Penn some State. Penn State at center, a little bit in Dallas, his practice plenty at center, but he hasn't played extensively at center, not professionally anyway. So yep. he got in the center, and then David Edwards is a guard, your starting guard who was one hell of a jumble six lineman yeah, last year. Yeah, he was good. He had the best BFF run blocking grade on the team last year. Yeah, he, he, was, he was really good. But how do you feel about McGovern going to center and David Edwards playing guard? And do you think through the draft, which you're going to get to in a few, that there might be some legitimate, you know, they who knows who it might be, but they might draft somebody day two or early day three and, and maybe push David Edwards. That, like, that's not a given that David Edwards is going to slide in and be your starting guard this year. Okay, so I don't want to come on here and just uh, everything I, I, I think about the Bills is just totally roses. I have faith in Connor McGovern playing center. I remember mm -hmm. scouting him out of Penn State. He played some center. I don't think he's a super mobile guard, and I think at center you can – you don't have to move as much. Right. Um, so I, I have, I don't want to say all the faith in the world because, like you're saying, this is the first time in the NFL that he's going to be extensively playing that spot. But I, I feel good about it. David Edwards at left guard, unless Aaron Cromer was sitting right here and, and could explain why it will work, I'm a little more skeptical of that. And, or I'm, I'm very skeptical of that. And it's why, like what you were pointing to, I do think whether it is third or I guess they don't have a third round pick, but fourth round, fifth round. I think there will be an interior offensive line, maybe even earlier, to be that maybe the guy to battle David Edwards and say, look, may the best man win, and, and we're going to start, you know, Osiris Torrance over Ryan Bates. We're not just going to hand it to the veteran. Two years, six million is not a lot for your starting no. left guard. And I, the last time we've seen David Edwards, even in L.A. with Aaron Cromer, he was not a great left guard. So the Bills were hoping to get a reclamation project. There was uh, a familiarity there. 
I'm not as confident in David Edwards as I am Conor McGovern. Well, look at this, man. We are here live at Imperial Beach, and I'm with Chris Trapasso, and you got Josh Allen, you got Stephon Diggs, you got skilled position players all over the place, receivers in the draft, and we are locked in on the <laughs> offensive line right it's important. now. The yeah. interior of the offensive line, nonetheless, and I love it. And in fact, on that note, I started this past week a series. I'm doing five weekly Buffalo Bills mock drafts. Smart. And each week I have a different guest with me, and he's going to be the GM, kind of in charge of the mock. Week one, Bruce Nolan from uh, Buffalo Rumblings did the mock. The Bills get on the clock at 28. Adani Mitchell is on the board. A couple other guys worthy on the board. And Bruce Nolan, the GM for the day, takes uh, the center from Oregon, Jackson Powers Johnson. Yeah. And I'm like, what? And he kind of elaborated on why, you know, the guy, first of all, the guy's a stud. He says he's a top 15, 16 player in this draft. And he goes, also, remember Eric Wood and a lot of other centers. They Sometimes a center, like even if they're committed, let's just say they're committed to Connor McGovern at center this year, sure. okay? It's, it's not, it doesn't exclude them from drafting a center and starting at guard. Like Eric Wood, yeah, a did. first round pick for the Bills. Yeah, he came out of Louisville. He was a center his first season, and because I think they had Jeff Harker, Hartgarner his first. Yes, uh, you're right. His first. Oh nine. Yeah, Jeff Hand- Hartner, Yeah. Yep. So Eric Wood started his career at guard, and he then did. he transitioned in the center. Do you see a scenario where if a guy who's that good, who's that highly rated, like Jackson Powers Johnson, is is available, that the Bills? hypothetically could pull the trigger on him and, and say, all right, well, this is going to be a guard for now and ultimately a, a center. Yeah, I think so. And I tweeted it that I, I, I like quote tweeted that and said, this would be a home run scenario for the bills. And a lot of mm. people were like, what? Not a receiver. He went wide receiver in round two, which we can get to later. I would love that pick. I don't have Jackson powers Johnson as a top 15 player, but I do have him I believe in my top 25. Mm. And I think the return on investment a wide receiver moves a needle more than anything else beyond quarterback to me in today's NFL. Yeah. But if you draft Jackson Powers Johnson, he is on your offensive line for the next 10 years. And what's interesting and a little bit more specific and nuanced, he's not a 6'1", 290-pound center. He's 6'2", 330. He has guard Ooh. size. He's one of the biggest guards in the really? class. I didn't know that. Go. It, it's something like he's 6'3", six, Six six two six three big boy over three hundred and twenty five pounds. So he looks like a guard, but he moves like a center. So he could easily make that transition, whether it's just in year one or he stays at guard. And suddenly the Bills are back to where they were last year, where they're loaded up front and can kind of maul people, ground game, and just protecting Josh Allen. I would be fine with that, given the depth of the receiver position. If they want Jackson Powers Johnson, first. and can you make a, a fair case that while it's not sexy, okay, it's not the, uh, it's it's not the, I you know, it's not the appealing thing. No, but if you get, let's just say they were to take him, just for the sake of discussion here, okay. Now you got Torrance who's going in the year two. He's locked in for a while, mm-hmm. at least three more years. Deion Dawkins just signed an extension. It appears to me Spencer Brown feels like a guy who's going to get an extension yeah. at some point. I thought he had an excellent, excellent bounce back season last yes, year. He, did. he was terrible last the year before, but he was also injured and not a hundred percent. And Brand, and you know, I remember this too. I remember Randy Bean talking about his back in the beginning of last off season. I'm like, dude, he's just not that good. And, you know, he's making other <laughs> guys full of shit. Well, he wasn't full of shit because Spencer Brown was a strength on this football team last year. Anyway, my point is this. So you got your two tackles, potentially long-term. You got Torrance for sure. Right you go draft a, a, a guy like this in the first round, and now you got three or maybe 80% of your offensive line locked up for four to five years for your $258 million quarter. What do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, I think it would be great, and, and not to always just pull in the Chiefs, but I think what has been an underrated part of the Chiefs' back-to-back Super Bowls they went Creed Humphrey uh, in the second round, right ahead of Boogie, or right after Boogie Basham, and then Trey Smith in that sixth round in 2021. Those two at center and guard have been awesome for the mm-hmm. Chiefs. Now they're going to have to pay them soon. They got to make a decision: are they paying both? How are they doing that? And that's why their their tackle position has been bad. But the Chiefs have been able to run the football with with Isaiah Pacheco in that divisional round game, and then even against the Ravens, Patrick Mahomes was like not touched. I think that is low key important, and it certainly the board would have to fall the right way. But if like four or five wide receivers are off the board, and the Bills are like, "Hey, we really like the depth better." Chop Robinson's gone. Latu Latu from UCLA, the other edge rusher that I think is a premier talent, he's gone. 
I would be fine with Jackson Powers Johnson. It wouldn't be sexy, but it would give the Bills great long-term re- return on investment up front. I want to talk about these wide receivers. Well, I do, by the way. We're here live in real time. You pull up your Twitter or you get on your phone. Hit that hit that retweet button, sure. too. Let people know we're live. Because of my error, we went live way later. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Way later uh, than we were supposed to. So, anyway, yeah, that, that's definitely a, a potential scenario with the offensive line. And, like I said, I wasn't thinking much about that until Bruce brought that up. I would love it. Which, you know, you know what annoyed me about that mock, too, is, like, of course. Because I said A.D. Mitchell's on the board. Guess where he goes Chiefs. in the mock draft? He goes to the Kansas City Chiefs. Mm. I'm like, of course he does. Of course he does. Let's talk about these. Uh, let's talk about the wide receivers here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Minus the, the big top, three. The top guys. Yeah. All right. Let me. Well, actually, let me ask you this. Do you think it's even remotely semi-realistic that the Bills would go up high enough to, say, maybe get into the top ten? If they're going to get one of these three receivers, it has to be in the top ten, right? Probably, but let's kind of break this down. We on One Bills Live, we talked about this. We looked at multiple draft pick value charts. 28 and next year's first, which I know no one wants to trade, but if if they did that, mm-hmm. that on almost every trade value chart gets them to like pick 10 or 11. Oh, okay. so that gets you close. Now, to get one of the big three, I think would be a stretch because I don't know how Roma Dunze and the other two get past the, the Bears at nine. But Brian Thomas, and maybe it's Brian Thomas ahead of Roma Dunze, he tested better. The fourth receiver, whether it's a Dunze or Brian Thomas from LSU, and there's some connections with Joe Brady and mm-hmm. uh, Ronald Curry down there in New Orleans in that area. I don't, I think pick 12, 13, 14, 15. I, I don't think to, to move pick 28 and the second round selection, 60, and then maybe a future like mid rounder. That's not going to get it done. I, no, I, I think oh, that would right? get it done. They can get with 28 and 60 would get you right to about 18 or 19. So you throw in an extra mid-rounder, you get up another pick or two. I wouldn't necessarily do that. Like I, I'm not pounding the table for it. I wouldn't hate it because I do think they need another receiver. And we know Brandon Bean it loves to be aggressive and just sees his guy and salivates and has to make that move. Do you think Odunze or Brian Thomas Jr. are – potentially worth the scenario where you're going to lose your, your first round next pick year. next year? I think Brian Thomas is. Um, I, I'm a little lower on Roman Dunze. It seems like the media, like Daniel Jeremiah loves him, yeah. and and it feels like he is just going to be gone well inside the top 10, so I haven't really thought about that for the Bills. But I have Brian Thomas graded as my number 12 overall player. Odunze, I think I have at like 16 or 17. So I, I think Brian Thomas, because of the four, low 4-3 four, speed, the vertical, uh, he does a lot of what Romo Odunze does, but he has more speed down the field, and I think he's a better separator. So if the Bills are like, hey, we're not going to have a pick next year, but we are going to be set with Diggs for this season, Brian Thomas, Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel, Dalton Kincaid, and we're feeling good about the long-term future going into the new stadium in a couple years, drafting Brian Thomas and making that aggressive move, it's one of the kind of rare exceptions where I would be okay with it. I was watching a uh, a PFF. I think it was, I think it was a PFF podcast uh, okay. on video on YouTube, and they brought up Brian Thomas Jr. and one of the comps that I heard was Gabe Davis actually. Which at first I'm like, it is. I'm, I'm like, okay. Um, no. In terms of why I think they were talking about in terms of just being a big guy who can get vertical, get vertical okay. down the field. But I'm going to assume that if he's highly regarded as he is, which you're saying he is, and I've seen lots of other people yep. say, you know, the same thing about Brian Thomas Jr. I'm going to assume he's got more to his arsenal than just being a big guy oh, who absolutely. can run really fast. Oh, my gosh. In terms of yards after the catch, the flexibility that's needed, the the cutting skill like a running back, bouncing off tacklers, uh, he does that five times better than Gabe Davis did. That was always my biggest gripe with, with Gabe Davis for how many big plays he made near the sideline on back shoulders. Did you ever see him break a tackle and like do anything similar to Debo Samuel and make someone no. miss? No, he could run away from people because he was a long strider. Sure. Brian Thomas ran four three four. Gabe Davis ran in the four five. So the speed element is different. They're around the same size. And I think Brian Thomas has much better hands than Gabe Davis. So to me, he would be, if you want to comp him to Gabe Davis, I don't see that stylistically at all. But if you're like, hey, the Bills need that Gabe Davis element of the downfield on the perimeter. Brian Thomas can do that and is more explosive and more sure-handed than Gabe Davis. Okay, so let's 
assume that Brandon Bean either can't trade up Which, high enough. Let's sure. say he can trade up, but he's not he's not gonna be able to trade up high enough to get one of the we'll call them the big four receivers. Yes. Let's say the Bills are at 28, or let's just say they have an opportunity maybe to move up to just a couple spots, 25, sure. 26. Okay. Something that might only cost them like a fourth and a, a fourth sixth. And, yeah, something, something like, along those lines. They have a bunch of those. Picks. You look at the, the, the next tier of receivers, mm -hmm. Adani Mitchell, um, Lad McConkey. Those are the two that we hear about the mm -hmm. most. Maybe a couple other ones as well. Xavier Worthy is certainly a name that gets discussed. I mean, his speed uh, just completely blows you away. I don't want to ask you if you would draft them in terms of – because you could come back to me and say, well, who's on the board? Yeah, sure. You know, sure. Is Job Robinson on the board? Yeah. You know, there's there's other guys that might be on the board and what might make you think. But So I, I suppose what I should ask you is, would you be good, depending on the circumstance, how it fell, any of these receivers with the Bills drafting in the first round, where you will say on draft night, I think this was a good pick. And here's why I think this was a good okay. pick. Okay. Um, in terms of what you said at first, like trading up, even sending like a fourth or a fifth, there's really no one else outside of the big four that I would do that for. It's it's to me, it's either make the big ascension to get the Roma Dunze or the Brian Thomas, or if for some reason Marvin Harrison Jr. after all this Malik Neighbors hype is still on the board at ten or eleven, do that mm -hmm. as opposed to trading what they have one twenty eight and one thirty three in the fourth round instead of trading one of those to get Lad McConkey or Ad Mitchell. Now, if you stay put and you don't trade that extra pick, I'm fine with Lad McConkey. Ad Mitchell scares me a little bit i have him graded in like the low 30s I, he scares me because for all of the testing and the size he ran 433 40 inch vertical i wonder why was he not more productive like brian thomas great point he's one of those kind of classic yeah. cases brian thomas had 17 touchdowns last year mm -hmm. well over a thousand yards you saw ad mitchell make plays he's certainly on the draft radar early but it was kind of like the Xavier Worthy show. And Jatavian Sanders, who's a tight end, is probably going to be one of the first tight ends off the board. It was like, why wasn't A.D. Mitchell more dominant if he's so big and so fast and so good in contested catch situations? So that would just scare me a little and why I would kind of lean away from trading up for that player. I think it's either go big or stay put, pick a lad McConkey. Um, I, I love Javon Baker, but they don't need to pick him that early. Right. Um, or what we talked about off the air. If Chop Robinson and, and Liatu Latu from UCLA, if either of those two are there, because I think there is a precipitous drop-off at the edge rusher spot, go there and then just lean into the depth in the second round at wide receiver. You have a great point that I don't think enough people talk about with Mitchell. For all of his attributes, for his size, for his speed, for his testing numbers, you look at, you know, you look at, at the man and you're like, holy shit, He's you're a prototype. YouTube. Yeah, absolutely the prototype. And you look at his production and he only had like a couple games we had over 80 yards receiving yep. for the season. It's like, well, shouldn't this guy be absolutely, utterly dominating? Mm -hmm. And I know they had Xavier Worthy too. By the way, yeah. how did Texas lose football games I with don't some know, of these man. first round, first Byron and second Murphy round too. prospects? Yeah, I don't know. Sweat, right? Didn't Sweat go to Texas? Devondre Sweat, Jeez. Byron Murphy. How did this team ever lose? Yeah, I mean, they got <laughs> they got close to the national title, but yeah, I, I don't know how over the last two years they. They did a great job recruiting, and they just didn't quite get over the hump against Washington. How do you feel about Lam McCocky as a potential Buffalo Bills draft pick? Let's say well, there's 28. Let's say maybe they move back 31, 32, or something like that. Doesn't seem like the type of – I hate saying that because we don't know what type they're even yeah. looking for. You would think the Bills want a 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", boundary-type receiver, but – this offense seems a lot, you know, predicated on explosiveness and yep. getting off lines and quick separation, mm -hmm. which they, you know, they haven't been great at separation over the last couple of years. No. But anyway, another type of maybe like maybe Stephon Diggs, I guess, type receiver. Uh -huh. um, how do you feel about Lam McConkey potentially with the Bills? So I have him in my top twenty. Uh, after he how he tested, I was I was not blown away because he f looked like he was fast on film in the SEC, but he ran four three nine. Had a 38, 39 inch vertical. So he's a big time athlete. And to your point, I think it's easy, and this is not pulling the race card or anything, but it's easy to see a white receiver and go, oh, he's a slot guy. Watch the film. He mm. won on the perimeter at Georgia against Auburn, against Alabama, against LSU. He can win on the perimeter. I think everything he does fits what the Bills have liked in the past. Now, what I think is important to realize, there's some new assistant coaches. There's Joe Brady's first year to kind of incorporate his offense. Does he want the 
quick separators doesn't care about size. I, I, I pointed at you when you were saying that because Brandon Bean in the owners' meetings just brought up, like, we kind of want something we don't have size-wise in the receiver room and yards after the catchability. If that's true, and I know we're in lying season, um, if that's mm. true, then it's not Lad McConkey because he is six foot, 180 pounds. But I think the separation, sneaky good yards after the catch. Uh, he just has kind of short arms and tiny hands, but he really didn't have a, a drop problem. He kind of fits the John Brown, Cole Beasley, Stephon Diggs bills more than maybe what they want in the future. But I would be fine if they stay put. I'm not as big of a trade up advocate as people might think after me talking about Brian Thomas. Um, I would be fine a trade back or just staying put and picking them because I think he's a high floor wide receiver. You know, it is worth noting, too, that Brandon Bean has traded up almost every year in the first <laughs> yeah. round. So it shouldn't be shocking. I think it might be a little bit harder this year, though, to move up with any significance without getting into 2025 mm -hmm. because they don't have that third round pick yeah. uh, this year. Two more receivers that I wanted to mention specifically. One, Xavier Worthy. And I, and I, I almost feel silly asking you this. Because a week ago, this would have been silly. But now I don't think it is silly. We all know how explosive he is. We know how, how he can one. run. He's also a great returner. Mm -hmm. And with these new rules, ah. the kickoff is going to potentially matter more oh, now. Sure. So, you know, having somebody who can do things and also return the football in this, I don't want to say, yeah, in today's NFL or yeah. what it will be, yeah. might add more value to him. Is he a guy worth the consideration with that pick based on this roster or are you still like yeah there's a handful of other guys i'm gonna take before him all right receiver. i'm gonna be on the fence here which i know is not good i should have a take that's that's very definitive i'm gonna be on the fence in that it's you're right that a week ago it, it didn't feel as good about him going to the bills because there was we didn't know what was gonna happen with the kickoffs mm -hmm. and it's it's to me in my head being likened to like when the bills picked Leotis McKelvin in the first round, there was, Oh, he's a great corner and he's a great returner. And that was a thing. It was like, you could double dip and you get yeah. an explosive returner. Xavier worthy is that guy. The only reason why I would say no is I've been of the belief and the bills may not do this, but I've been of the belief that, and I talked about it with Brian Thomas, this first round or second round pick at receiver. And I would be stunned if they don't pick a receiver in one of the first two rounds has to eventually have that wide receiver one ability. This is, to me, Stephon Diggs last season. Do I think Steph, uh, Xavier Worthy is like Marquise Goodwin 2.0? No. I think he's better than that. I think he runs better routes. Do I see him, again, in the Bills' new stadium in two years as this 90-catch, 1,300-yard, 14-touchdown receiver? No. I think he's more of a faster version of Curtis Samuel, which they already have, and that's more redundancy that Brandon Beans kind of wanted to yeah. shy away from. So that's the only reason why I would, even a month ago, pre-Curtis Samuel, I would say, yeah, Xavier really brings some explosiveness to the offense. Curtis Samuel ran 4-3-1 coming out of Ohio State, so he's got plenty of juice as well and is on a, uh, uh, a multi-year deal. So that's kind of why I, I would lean against it, but the returnability does kind of keep him in the back of your mind. I want to ask you, the last receiver I want to ask you about specifically is the one that I think I've become most intrigued with okay. recently. Yeah, let's hear it. All right, the top four, I think, are realistically out of play. That's just yeah. how yeah, I feel. Yeah, they are. They are. Um, so when we, about Mitchell, because of the reasons that you said, I just, where's the production? That concerns me a little bit. McConkie, I could, I'm not going to be mad if they take McConkie. Let mm -hmm. me just put that. Give me a little bit of a hot take, too. I think he's going to be a star in this league. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to be with the Bills. He has, he has I, that high floor. He's, he's got that guy. He's got that. He does. I think he's going to be a star player in this league. Not that sold on worthy. Xavier to look at, though, is a guy that okay. I'm just starting to learn about. It doesn't feel like he's a first-round pick, which mm -hmm. I, how do I know that, of course. But I also don't think his guy is going to be there at 60 either. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. But he feels like a guy to me, based on what I've read and, and seen, his skill set, that you're talking about a guy that you could draft and maybe week one he's not your starter. Maybe he's not he's not going to catch 70 passes as a rookie. But he's a guy that's got skill and can be developed, and eventually he does have that potential wide receiver one long-term ability, and he fits that profile, that boundary receiver, yeah. too, that we're talking about. What, what, what are your feelings with Xavier Leggett? So Xavier Leggett, to me, for the Bills – will be that litmus test for what this new new-ish coaching staff likes because they have not liked this type. This the 6'1, 220, sure. Debo Samuel, DJ Moore, AJ Brown types. They've shied away from that. They've gone with the quicker, smaller separators. If you like that type, and I tend to I kind of gravitate toward the the Debo Samuels because I'm such a yards after the catch guy, 
That's where Xavier Leggett really thrives. I don't think he quite thrives the way that people think he does. They see mm-hmm. the South Carolina helmet, and they think he's Debo Samuel 2.0. <laughs> I don't think he's that good bouncing off tacklers. The contact balance uh, is not quite there, but he is 6'1", 220, ran under 4'4". So, like, that's freaky. That's first-round caliber. I think the reason why we're not hearing about him as a potential pick 28, and he could be. I mean, all it takes is one team, is that the first – three years of his career in the sec he had like 400 yards receiving in his last year over a thousand mm-hmm. so i think the thought is hey wh- why did this only happen when you were 23 years old but we will see and certainly joe brady in at lsu featured jamar chase who's more of that stockier bounce off tackles type of player if the bills go chop robinson in the first round or trade back and then pick xavier Leggett, we will know that this kind of will signal that they're going in a new direction with the flavor of wide receiver that they like we are here live at Imperial Pizza in South Buffalo. I'm with Chris Trapasso from CBS Sports. You know what? We were having our wings, which, again, I can't say enough about this place and just how good those Rock wings solid. were. Which, by the way, typically when I do a show here, I might, you know, I get way more wings than I'm going to eat. I maybe have two or three. <laughs> I was full. If there was a silver lining in our equipment mishap, well, my equipment mishap, it's that it gave my stomach a little more time. Yeah, settle, that's true. I really banged out a lot of wings there. Um at Imperial Pizza. Well, you know, all's well that ends well. We're still got like around 500 people right now live yeah, on great. the stream for being an hour late, too. Yeah, Pretty good. Thank you. All guys. right. So we spent a lot of time talking about wide receiver, understandably so. And you said that you think the Bills are going to take one in the first two rounds. It's got to be. be. I, I tend to agree as well. But I want to kind of move this conversation to the edge, guys. Which, by the way, at dinner tonight, what did I tell you? I said, well, it won't be a terribly long episode, you know, 20 hey, minutes, 60 it's, minutes. It's my Guess fault. what? We are headed towards a little bit over 60 minutes anyway, but that's all right, man, because sure. we're we're rocking and rolling here, and this is a good conversation. But uh, defensive end, yep. I feel personally, I don't know if you agree or not, but if you're going to say that this team has a need, not just necessarily for week one of 2024, but beyond, I can make I think I think I can make a pretty reasonable case. That a good edge rusher oh, yeah. could be at the very top of the list. I For mean, sure. You got 35-year-old Vaughn Miller. You got um Greg Greg Rizzo. Who knows where he'll be in two years? He'll be here back because he'll gonna give him his fifth year, of course. Yeah. AJ Vanessa is pretty good. Not but you great. know, you know what he is at this point yeah, of his career. I, I think you can make a case that you need that great, you know, that next great edge rusher. Is there one in this class that you know is realistic for the Bills potentially? To go get there's two chop robinson we mentioned him earlier from penn state and he would maybe signal the bills going against the grain or kind of evolving because he's more von miller size they've gravitated toward rousseau and boogie basham and mm-hmm. aj epinesa that are six four six five big boys two, big guys and super length that's not chop robinson but the get off the burst the bend that i think has been missing on the Bills defensive line over the last couple of years where they can win with power, but it takes like an extra second. They're close to Patrick Mahomes, but they don't quite get there. Chop Robinson wins around the corner in under two and a half seconds. Are the pass rush moves there yet? No, but what I like that despite that, his pressure creation rate was close to 20% in each of the last two years. So he wasn't really doing much with his hands and just winning around the corner. You've mentioned to me that it's kind of been a known fact now that Von Miller is such a great mentor and that yeah. he can, and he's that 6'2", 240 pound edge rusher. It's one thing if you're teaching that to Gregory, or, you know, teaching pass rush moves to Gregory Rousseau, who's 6'7", 270, when you're more of the same size, I think Chop Robinson, again, tell me who's on the board, but if Chop Robinson is there or Liatu Latu, who's more of the normal, the classic Bills defensive end, who's great with his hands, not quite a, as good of an athlete as Chop, if either of those two are there, and there's going to be some receivers on the board. Don't be surprised if the Bills take a little bit of time to send in that pick. Latu is a guy who... Um, have you watched his film? Yes. he's His hand work is awesome. I, I, I have. And yes. Swim and moves, he's, he's swipe had, move, everything. He, wasn't, wasn't he medically re- retired? Tired, yeah. yeah. Is that could be potentially a reason why he might oh. fall down on some draft boards? Because if that wasn't an issue... We probably wouldn't be discussing him because he'd probably be a, a lock player, 10, top 10, 12 pick. Right? And very quickly, don't forget Jalen Phillips of the Miami Dolphins, who tore his Achilles late in the season last year, was like a breakout star for them. He ironically started at UCLA, had a neck problem, medically retired, comes back, goes to the University of Miami with Gregory Russo, and 
was picked ahead of Russo and was super good for the Dolphins before that injury. When he comes back, he's a top 10 or 15 edge rusher. Sure. So just because you have that pass doesn't mean you can't be a good player, but that could be a reason why a lot too falls. Yeah, well, yeah, even potentially, because otherwise I don't even think it would be a discussion about no, it him potentially be. even being there. No. Let me ask you this. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here. Okay. And I will preface this by saying you certainly have a right to change your mind between now okay. and the draft, and you probably will 100 times. But let's just say, for the sake of discussion, the top four receivers are gone. Okay. Latu's gone. Uh, the center's gone, too, just for the hell of it. Let's get there. And it comes down to you could take Chop Robinson or you got Mitchell and McConkey. Those are the best two receivers on the board, Ooh. and Chop Robinson's on the board. Because before I was saying, well, you got to tell me who's there. So now I am telling okay. you who's there. Okay. Chop Robinson's there. Mitchell's there. McConkey's there. Uh, I, I maybe one of the top two or three defensive tackles are, are there yeah, as well. Okay. Where are you going? I'm going to probably go Chop Robinson because yeah, I, I've evaluated this this whole edge class. And like I said earlier, it's the it's the four Dallas Turner from Alabama, uh, Jared Verse from Florida State, Chop Robinson and Latu. And then I think there is a drop where you get to, oh, who could we just pick at 60? Chris Braswell from, from Alabama is good. He's probably going to be gone before that. Right. After that, it's like there's not that second tier. The wide receiver class has that. And I love Javon Baker. We'll get to him. You know, Xavier Leggett, who we just talked about. There's so many more names at receiver than there is at edge rusher. And I think that is a key point of emphasis for the really good GMs to be able to navigate the board and under, and certainly Brandon Bean knows this even better than I do, but like, all right, if we go here, what does the positional depth look like later? I would go Chop Robinson. You know, if this was a, uh, if this was a, a crime and we were investigating a crime right now, and we were detectives, I would say, you know what, Chris, I think you broke the case because that's what I think too, that the drop off, if you need an edge and you need a receiver, you could get a receiver later on. Sure. Maybe even day two, you know, or third round if they wanted to move up from four or whatever to get yeah, to three. Even sure. if they didn't get one in the first two, which I think they're going to. But my point is this. You're right. If they don't go get their edge rusher and they identify that as a need, if you don't get it 25 to 40 maybe, There's you don't get it in off. that range, the drop off is, is really big. That's why I think sometimes we – we, we overanalyze everything and, and, you know, at some point during this process, you're going to convince yourself that they're going to take nine different positions. That's <laughs> why I don't think it's going to be your wide receiver at, at, at 28 because of the depth. And I do think it, I'm not going to bet on it being an edge because we don't even know John Robinson might not be there either. Yeah, sure. But if he is, I could see them going edge because of the lack of depth in what the drop I, off. What I would say, what has been a slight problem for, for Brandon being in the draft and he's done a better job with the roster this year to, like we said, to not telegraph it. In 2022, it was like they need a corner. They are going to pick a corner. They, I maybe panicked a little bit after Trent McDuffie goes off the board. The Chiefs trade up. They're like, we got to get our last first round grade, so to speak, corner. That's what they said in Kyir Elam. They forced that pick. They could have gone a different position and said, hey, we're the cornerback class just didn't come to us. We're, we'll pick one later and gone in a different direction. I think. You have your biggest need, but you don't have to address your biggest need in the first round. Sure. Um, them signing Austin Johnson recently, not, you know, I don't think that's like a huge impact. Although I will say last year to me, I thought the biggest weakness of the Buffalo Bills, the entire football team to me, was the lack of depth behind a defensive tackle Jones position. And Ed Oliver, yeah. yeah, I'm not talking about the names. I'm talking about their performance. Yeah, You know, when Daquan or Ed weren't on the field, the drop off to me is huge. Yeah. So I think just Austin Johnson, if you're going to set the bar at Puna Ford and Tim Settle and Jordan Phillips, I'd be stunned if he's not as better than what yeah, they did. I think so too. So that doesn't mean I think he's going to be a star player. But I guess what I'm asking you is this going out and resigning to Quan, of course, and then adding Austin Johnson before the draft, mm -hmm. does that maybe alleviate some pressure? You just talked about maybe having a force of pick. If they don't have a veteran like Austin Johnson behind Daquan, Maybe they got to take a defensive tackle that maybe they don't love earlier in the draft than they otherwise might have needed to. Yeah, that's a good question. Brandon Bean talked about that at the owners meeting and said, you know, the number one priority, like we, we talked about for the Bills going into free agency was adding some pieces to the defensive line because all right. he had was that Oliver yeah. was signed and he's done that. So I do think it does alleviate some of the pressure, but to go next level on it. Austin Johnson is kind of a Daquan Jones type. He's big body, 6'4", 320. He's going to eat blockers, keep the linebackers clean. Deshaun Williams, who they just signed, is a little bit undersized, but he's kind of that type of player. 
I have been kind of banging the table the last few years, even as Ed Oliver has the breakout in 2023. They need another interior pass rusher. They mm-hmm. have they've had the Star Latulale, they've had the Quentin Jefferson, Daquan Jones, Jordan Phillips, these big body guys. And certainly in his prime, so to speak, Jordan Phillips could get up the field. But a Johnny Newton from Illinois, Byron Murphy from Texas, even Braden Fisk, who was the most explosive defensive tackle at the combine, was so good at Florida State. Those are, I mean, maybe outside uh options in the first round and in the second round i think to have someone that can also get after the quarterback beyond ed oliver at defensive tech i think is low-key important how much stock do you put in the combine by the way should i ask you that earlier a fair amount i I, pro days basically zero and this is gonna this is is all scripted right yeah it's just pro days to me i mean you get the numbers i guess and you can't fudge a vertical or a broad jump at the floor you could fudge a little um, pro days mean basically zero to me. And what this is where I know I differ from most of the league and seemingly the bills, the senior bowl for as great of a job as Jim Nagy does bringing the talent in. And that, I've been down there a bunch. The week is fun for like Dave Gettleman to say, I watched one drive of Daniel Jones at the senior bowl. And I knew I was going to pick him. I was like, what? <laughs> what? You, you could watch him for three years at Duke and, and see that he wasn't worthy of the number six overall pick. Like the senior bowl to me does not matter very much at all either because you're just throwing these guys and you're not even evaluating the game. You're evaluating practice. To me, the combine matters because most of the great players in the NFL, not all of them, but most of them, the vast majority are plus athletes. Your Von Miller's, your Luke Keekley to go back. He, he's one that from Brandon Bean's time in Carolina, I think mm-hmm. that's your prototypical linebacker. Um, the really good athletes are usually the good players. And if a guy's not a great athlete, he has to be like so good in every other area to eventually be successful in the NFL. So it's mostly film, but not super far behind, I think, is looking at those combine numbers and comparing it to other players in the past. I want to quickly circle or weave, I should say, back to the Bruce Nolan mock that we did earlier this week because in the second round, after taking the center in the first, he took Javon Baker, wide receiver in the second, which you're clapping right now for people who are watching on the video side here. Obviously, you like the pick. Tell me why. Because what we talked about earlier that, all right, you close your eyes and you think, can this player at wide receiver be the wide receiver one in 2025? Can he produce a little bit as a rookie? There's a lot of mouths to feed in this offense, but can he be that new Stefan Diggs in 2025? Javon Baker is the second tier or second round option that I think is best to do that. You watch his film at UCF. He was at, he was at Alabama transfers to UCF two straight years, super productive. Didn't run particularly fast, ran in the four fives, which I think heightens the chances that he's there at 60 can beat press coverage at the line of scrimmage with physicality, with wiggle, the sharp route running skills are there. He, you know, shoulder fakes, head fakes, catches everything. Contested catches are awesome, and he's good after the catch. He kind of feels like a bigger version of Stephon Diggs stylistically. I'm not going to say he's going to lead the league in receiving in his fifth year, but he is the one that kind of feels like that, maybe not amazing at anything, but good in every area and can win on the perimeter, which I think is important. Do you think it's a... How much of a foregone conclusion do you think it is right now that this is probably going to be Stefan Diggs' final season in Buffalo? Between the contract, between the age, between the production, between the one football, a lot of miles, sure, between sure, sure. cryptic tweets, you got to roll it all in the <laughs> one, man. Dang. I think it's, I would say, 80%. 90%. Yeah. I mean, maybe if beyond all that, maybe Diggs, you know, he's always come out to the media and said, I love Buffalo, I want to retire here. Could he be someone that has made as much money as he's made and be like, look, I'll I'll take a reduced deal or something? Eventually, we've seen more Bills do that in this era than like since the 90s, where guys like Matt Milano comes back and Jordan Poyer comes back last year and like, oh, they took a hometown discount. Sure. That was like the Bills were always overpaying for the guys to come up. They here had you for 18 years. Just wait till the Sabres offseason. Yeah, you think that's bad. My <laughs> God, let's not let's not talk about the Sabres. Um so, but I would still say, based on the age, the mouths, the feed, the production, it kind of feels like, kind of like I felt with Mitch Morris and even Jordan Poyer to a certain degree, that it's like, okay, let's play 2024 and then we'll go our separate ways and it'll be good for him and for the finances for the bill. So I would say 80% chance that this is his last season coming up. I think it's pretty telling that for all the guys that they've went to and redid deals, restructured, extended, they didn't do it. They didn't touch his contract. They could have done year. it too and they did. They could have, but, you know, redoing his contract kind of. It? Like with, with Dawson Knox, Dawson Knox essentially took a bake out this year, but Dawson Knox ain't going nowhere next year either. Now he's here in 2025 because yeah. of that new deal. And I don't think that's going to be the case necessarily um, with Stefan. We'll, we'll wait and see about that. But anyway, yeah, Javon Baker just feels like a, a really good fit 
as well. I, I guess when it comes to like day three, okay. the two positions that I, I see right now, and who knows how things will play out, but safety yes. might be, uh, you know, a position that I, I feel like early in day three, round four or five is in that span where they could go. Do you feel like that's a yes. good spot based on Mike Edwards, based on Taylor Rapp? By the way, Bruce Nolan, surprisingly, at least to me a little bit, not he was very lukewarm on Taylor Rapp resigning with the Bills. Did okay. not love that move. But anyway, regardless of that, um, do you feel like that's an area maybe to target when it comes to, to grooming a safety? And there's maybe one or two guys out there that you think could be that kind of player. I, I think it's a guarantee that the Bills draft a safety there. I mean, to even bring in Mike Edwards, who's won you know two Super Bowls, was mm-hmm. a third-round pick, like good player, Taylor Rapp, before last season when he was – Injured, didn't play a lot, and maybe didn't play up to par. He was a middle-of-the-road guy. I think they want to add safety, a, a younger developmental type. Um, to me, the name that is most fascinating is Cameron Kinchins, and here's why. Number one, he's at the University of Miami. The Bills hire the defensive backs coach from the University of Miami. So early in the process, I'm like, oh, telegraph. Like, it's going to be Cam Kinchins in the first round. He had, like, uh, 11 interceptions the last two years. Mm-hmm. You watch the film, and you're like, oh, Kinchins is the guy. And I remember scouting him in the summer for preseason scouting. It was like, oh, yeah, he's the best safety in the class. What's fascinating about him, at the combine, he totally tanked. Like, ran yeah. into four sixes. His vertical was, like, the worst among all. It was like, I didn't see that on film. So is that something where the, the D-backs coach knows something and says, oh, maybe, you know, he didn't pay for the training that he needed, but I trust him. He's going to drop. He On film, he's a first. He was like, before the combine, he was like 28, 29 for me. Now he's like in the 60s because it, was it wasn't like average. It was horrific. Bad. It was really bad. If he's there in the fourth round with the familiarity with the defensive backs coach, he would be, I think, a great fit. There's a bunch of other safeties. I like this class a lot. In that third to fifth round range, I think the Bills, that was kind of the sweet spot for them to pick that position. And the other position, or I should say positions, where I could see that maybe adding some depth would be like the trenches. Mm-hmm. You know, just um again, maybe they go edge in the first, receiver in the second. If they don't pick in the third, you're in the day three right there. Yep. You, you see, like maybe whether it's an interior defensive lineman or interior offensive lineman adding to the mix, whether it's to challenge David Edwards for a starting spot or to add behind Daquan and add at the defensive tackle position. Um, yeah, there's yeah, I, I think that position too, it's kind of feels similar to safety that there's a little bit more top end talent at defensive tackle with Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton and maybe Braden Fisk to be in that those in that first round range. But Chris Jenkins from Michigan, his dad played for the Panthers forever, was a great player uh, and the Jets as well. Chris Jenkins from Michigan is just a rock solid guy who's a pretty good pass rusher, great run defender. Uh, Makai Wingo from LSU is another name. Michael Hall is such a great pass rusher. Watch the Michigan game, and that Michigan offensive line was great. I'm a Notre Dame fan. I remember him killing Notre Dame oh, a couple years, Michael two years Hall, ago. Michael Hall, and that's the thing, multiple years of high-level production as a pass rusher, a little bit undersized. And one other name that I'll throw out there, Brandon Dorless, and here's why. Oregon, 6'3", 6'4", 290. We always say, oh, the guy can play inside and outside. AJ Epines has never taken a snap inside, basically. He was right. they have kept him on the outside. Brandon Dorless really is that inside outside rusher. Reminds me just stylistically of Chris Jones when he was coming out of Mississippi State. Long, weird body type, pass rush moves, surprising quickness for being almost 300 pounds. He might be a fourth round pick. And like you're saying, building the trenches, I think, is important for this Bills team. Somebody on this dream said, uh, Diggs is retiring a bill. Don't be foolish. Prepping Maybe 890. No, I'll tell you what. I'm willing to bet money that he doesn't retire a Buffalo Bill. All right. Let's just, I love, listen, man. I love me some Stefan Diggs. He's come here and in four years, he's rewritten the book. He has. The record man. book. He has been everything Very you could steady. ever, ever ask for, man. 100 receptions or more, four straight years. There's only a couple of receivers in the history of the NFL. That have you know, I don't that. do a lot of research. I'm pretty lazy. <laughs> but one of the things I did research is how many receivers in the history of the NFL have had at least four straight seasons of 100 catches. Antonio Brown had six. Okay. Chris um, Carter, maybe? Huh? Chris Carter? No. Nope. No, not Chris Carter. One of them is still playing, Devontae Adams. Okay. Diggs had four. And there's one guy who I can't remember off but, the top of my head. So there's, there's only four. four in the history of the NFL that have ever had Impressive. four straight seasons Impressive. of 100 receptions. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. All right, so we're winding down here. I hate special teams, man. God, I hate special teams. And I hate to even talk about it. I'm sorry, but that's just how I feel about it. However, watching the 
the clips from how the new kickoff is going to be, it feels to me that is going to be a part of the game that sure. might matter. Does that affect potentially teams in terms of who they might draft based on guys being able to play special teams well? Because it felt to me, Chris, like special teams was starting to mean less and less. Oh. Kego just kicks the ball through the end Met zone. There's so much less returns. You know, you could get rid of Saran Neal. You get rid of Tyler Majakovic. <laughs> guys don't mean shit because Tyler Brass kicks the ball out of the end zone. Now, all of a sudden, guys it like matters. that who could cover and play special teams or block, it matters, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, that for guys to play special teams, definitely like your backup linebackers, your backup safeties like a Saran Neal, I think it certainly matters. What I would say, just to be fully honest, the college game, there wasn't a lot of returning either because that, that was the game that initially instituted the, you could call a fair catch anywhere. So I can't really give you like, oh, who, like who are the best returners in this class? Of course, there's still punt returns. But I think, yes, that it was leaning toward, oh, hey, I can be a great punt returner or a punt uh, coverage guy. Pick me in the sixth round. Okay, no one cares. Now I think that certainly will matter. How well do you tackle? How big are you? How physical are you? Um, so we'll definitely hear some of that on the broadcast during the draft. Like, oh, this guy instant special teamer <laughs> i was gonna say i, I, I promise I you brandon bean and sean mcdermott i have no idea who the players are yeah no, they're mean, gonna I find themselves some special teams guys yep. in this draft yep. they might not take all 11 you know picks in this draft but i promise you they are going to go they've lost to ron they've lost tyler mitzekovich i'm stunned that they have not signed a special team stud mm -hmm. they haven't even tried to which no. good who cares about that all right last question and i'm gonna let you go what kind of i'm gonna spare you some sabers talk be a nice guy please, here, man. Please. I feel bad that I uh that I made you sit here and wait while I had to go run all the way home to go get a cable cord so we can continue Good. to do this stream. So we'll, I'll spare you the Sabres talk here. But when you look at, you know, we've talked about the Bills, obviously, just talking Buffalo here. We're uh -huh. sitting there in South Buffalo at a pizzeria, eating wings and, and talking sports. From a league-wide perspective right now, you know, and, and the draft is still to come. But for the most part, I think free agency is over. And I Gone. think most of the trades that are going to happen for now have already happened. Give me a team or two that you really liked from this offseason, what they've done, and then maybe give me a team or two, vice versa, that you're like, oh, I really don't think this team's done much, if anything, to, to improve themselves. Okay, I will stay in the NFC East. Uh, and anyone that you know watched the Super Bowls in the 90s, my dad hates every team from the NFC East, so this will, this will be good. Uh, I'll start with the team that I think has done a great job is the Washington Commanders. Now, the only place really to go is up. After like moving on from uh, Daniel Snyder, they have their new owner, Josh Harris. Um, just looking at the list here, they bring in Austin Eckler, which older running back, Dorans Armstrong, who was great in Dallas as a rotational rusher, uh, Bobby Wagner, Frankie Louvu, who was so fun as a blitzing linebacker in Carolina, uh, Jeremy Chin, who was I, kind of I a like name him. that was like the Bills should maybe Big look at time. him. I, I think they've done a great job. Now, Dan Quinn is a retread offensive or uh, head coach. I'm not a huge fan of those, but he seems to have a great reputation in the league. Like he's a player's coach. Everyone loves him. He's super positive um, now. And they have a big decision at number two with the quarterback. But I think they've positioned themselves not to be, a, you know, superpower in the NFC, but they've made a lot of quality signings. They haven't broke the bank on the other end of it. And this, you know, a lot of Bills fans will like this. The Dallas Cowboys have signed one free agent, Eric, <laughs> Eric Kendricks, linebacker, who was great in his prime, is in his 30s now. Tyron Smith goes to the Jets. They lose their, their decade-long left tackle. They lose Dorrance Armstrong. Dante Fowler was there last year. He's now in Washington. He followed uh, Dan Quinn. That's a team where Jerry Jones keeps saying, oh, we're all in, we're all in. And now he's coming out this week saying, uh, this is kind of the last year for Dak Prescott. I think if you're a Cowboys fan, you're like, we can't even like win a playoff game. And when we do, we get blown out in the divisional round. And now our owner is saying we're all in. But no real movement and only subtractions in free agency. I would say Baltimore has lost a lot. They have. And they really haven't done much at all. Now they're still going to be a hell of a football team. Um, I agree with you about Washington. And Jeremy Chin was a guy who really wanted him. And I thought that was the guy who would have been perfect for uh, to take over for, for Jordan Poyer. Uh -huh. Which, by the way, I mean, you... You no, know, you do CBS stuff, and again, you're not just a, a Bills guy. I mean, you're based here, but you yeah. know, you cover I'm the league, talk guy. about the league. But yeah. obviously, you know, your roots are here in Western New York, yeah. and and you know this team well, and you know the fan base very well. With Jordan Boyer leaving and going to Miami, 
do you kind of get that sense Thurman that Thomas. you're you know you're on Twitter enough that the sense that that yeah like kind of like Thurman, but Thurman didn't have Twitter back in 2000 <laughs> when his ass got cut and finished his career wrapping it up in Miami. Do you get a sense that that bad blood's coming between him, his brother who likes to talk some shit on Twitter, mm. uh, his wife who, who if you're not blocked by her on Twitter, a lot of people have been blocked by her. But anyway, just the and then the Miami Dolphins talk fan base talking shit to the Bills. You so know Randy how it goes. Too, yeah. I mean, hopefully years down the road, Jordan retires a bill and is remembered the way he, you know, he finally deserves to yeah. be. But for now, this period, you kind of get a sense that shit might get ugly. Um, I mean, on Twitter, among Bills and Dolphins fans, I think yes. And that is the heated rivalry is back. We saw those, you know, those tight games the last couple of years and both teams are good. Both teams are making the playoffs. I think it's good for the rivalry because it was dead for 20 years after Kelly and Dan. So I, I think that uh, from that sense, yes, but I don't think Jordan Poyer is suddenly going to say, I hate Buffalo. I hate the bills fans. Um, he's going to be one and done in Miami and probably the, I mean, if he plays in 2025, I think it'll be surprising. And that's when he re-signs with the Bills for a one-day contract and retires in Buffalo. So I would say to, to fans, don't go at Jordan Poyer. He's just trying to get one more deal. And honestly, I think it was for as good as he kind of was transitioning to that dime linebacker role, I think it was time for the Bills to kind of move on from him. He got a little bit slower, and he dealt with so many injuries, played through a lot of them. But you can't just keep a guy around because he toughed it out. Um, at some point, you have to let him go. And I think it, it was time, and he just ultimately signed with the Bills, you know, historically biggest rival. I uh, I just think he wanted to go to Miami. I think he wanted to just live wanted there. Just wanted to be there, yeah. Because he wanted to be in Miami. Lee lives in Miami. His wife loves Miami. Their family yeah. is in Miami. Look, one year, $2 million contract. That's not even a – you're guaranteed to make this roster, let yeah, alone no, be a starter. Sure. He's a starter now, but it's also – the end of March, you know, it's yep. not September. Yep. So anyway, all right, we're going to get out. Got anything you want to plug, man? No, that's it. Uh, just everything CBS Sports the next couple weeks. Uh, I've had a big board come out this week, top 50. Still trying to watch as many prospects as possible. Uh, no, that's it. Just follow me on CBS Sports on Twitter, YouTube channel. I've kind of been starting to pop out some videos uh, there, TikTok as well. Like you're saying, got to keep evolving with the media. Uh, but just try to follow everything CBS Sports during the draft. I'll be doing the draft tracker from the second round through the last pick in the draft. So, okay. like, when you're following, like, the picks to see the instant analysis and the real-time grades, round one, I'm pretty sure, will be Pete Prisco, and I will do it from the rest of the draft. It's, like, my favorite. It's taxing. It takes – it's it's hard to do for those three days or those last two days, but I love it. So, if like, when the Bills make their pick, you want to see what my instant thought is and letter grade – that will be me on the CBS Sports Draft Tracker. This really is your time of year. You get a little more pep in your step. I do. There I do. At, at this time of year. All right. I want to big, give a big thank you one more time here, Chris Trapas. I also want to thank Imperial Pizza again. Great place. Great vibes, man. Bomb ass wings. Really sorry that I. Uh, oh, no, it's okay. That I, it was uh, funny. We, I feel like a little kid apologizing. I'm sorry that I uh, that I brought the wrong <laughs> charger and uh, had to go back. And by the way, thank you everybody. Not yes, only for you. people who are going to listen to this, but also the people that are watching. Like I said, ended with over 600 people live on this stream. Considering we literally started this almost a full hour late. <laughs> that's awesome. So big thank you to all you guys as well. Have a good weekend. Happy Easter. Be back day. with a brand new episode on Monday. Talk to you then.